Get back off now. Do I just start talking or do I wait for them to shut the door? All right. Can you all see this all right? Okay. And how about this stuff? OK. I brought the fun up as much as I could because I'm going to be spending a lot of time in the UI. And I know it'll be difficult to see if it's the regular size. But it's also kind of blurry on this screen. OK. This session deals with Windows Server 2003 terminal services. Hopefully, that's why you're here. As you may have noticed, you do not have my slide deck in your book. And there is a reason for that. It kind of relates to my employer as listed here. Up until about a week and a half ago, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do a session here. So it's been very last minute. And my employer did agree to allow me to do the session as long as I did not identify my employer or give you any proprietary information related to our implementation. What I can say is that I'm pretty sure we have one of the largest, if not the largest, Windows Server 2003 terminal services implementations in the world. And as a result, I've dealt with some painful issues. How many of you are using Windows Server 2003 terminal services? Show of hands. How many are not, since the ones who were raising their hands for that were really low? <laughs> OK, there are people who didn't raise their hands at all. <laughs> Pardon me? Right, but there was a, yeah, it was a binary question. How many of you are using 2003 terminal services? How many of you are not? There's got to be one answer in there. How many of you are using 2000 terminal services? OK. How many of you are considering using 2003 terminal services? And if you've looked into 2003 terminal services, do you figure it's pretty much the same as 2000? I got one no, that's good. It's not. How many of you have looked at uh, Microsoft's site to try to get some information about how you harden 2003 terminal services versus 2000? OK. Well, that'll bring me actually to the next slide. If you do scour Microsoft's site looking for information on what you should do to secure your 2003 terminal service, unfortunately, you're going to come up with a pretty small amount of information. You will get a one-line reference to use the Windows Server 2000 or Windows 2000 hardening guide, which is applicable in that all of those things you can still do. But the reality is there is so much that has changed with 2003 that if you use that guide to secure your 2003 servers, you're really wasting a lot of what you've been given in 2003. There is another article, a TechNet article, called Locking Down Windows Server 2003 Terminal Sessions. And that actually does have very valid information in it, but it is not what I would consider comprehensive. Also, over the past day and a half, you've attended a lot of sessions on hardening applications, hardening operating systems, stuff that I'm going to make the assumption you already know when you come in here. I'm, not going to be, I'm hopefully not going to be telling you the same things that you got in the other sessions. This is going to be fairly focused on terminal services specific settings, although we will be looking a lot at group policy. And I'm going to point out some of the changes in group policy. Now, back to the slides. I will work out with Black Hat a way to get you these slides. I'm not sure what that will be. But one way or another, I can get you these slides. And I can give you an email address as well. And I can email them to you directly even before I give them, hand them off to Black Hat. One of the things that I will try to do is to add to the slides some of the things that I do in demo so that you have screenshots of some of the things that happen in this session just for reference purposes. OK, so what's the problem with this behemoth amount of documentation that Microsoft offers for 2003 terminal services? 2003 is not 2000. 
2000 was far more secure than NT, obviously. 2000 can be secured relatively well, relatively. But there are a lot of ways to exploit 2000, the operating system that are very easily taken advantage of with terminal services that Microsoft has addressed in 2003. Because so much has changed, not just with the operating system security, but with what you can do as far as terminal services, I kind of thought there maybe should be a session on 2003 specific stuff. There are new groups related to both Active Directory functionality and terminal services functionality. If you haven't seen them, you will. There are new group policies specifically for terminal services as well as a bunch of new group policies for operating system hardening and so forth. New application development practices. How many of you are developers? Holy cow. And the rest of you are systems people? I am not a developer. I will never, ever, I don't care if I could write any language on the planet, decompile, recompile, I will never say I'm a developer because I'm not. I'm a systems weenie. That is, is my focus area. So I'm not going to be giving you a lot of code sample. But for those of you who are developers, are you using the .NET framework? Are you developing for .NET? Do you know why you should be? I got two people nodding, and the rest of the developers suddenly got much quieter. All right, for you two, why are you using .NET? Why are you developing for .NET? Experimental? OK. <laughs> Well, research wasn't really what I was hoping for. <laughs> but with, with new development, with the, the .NET framework, with developing for the .NET framework, one of the things that Microsoft has done is to make security an inherent part of the development process. Get your developers trained. For those of you who are not developers, get them training on what's new and cool and nifty from Microsoft because of the fact that they're now being taught to think a little more like systems people, and systems people are being taught to think a little more like developers in that it's no longer the you chew up my bandwidth, you restrict what I'm allowed to do camps, which is historically where developers and sysadmins have been. With 2003, developers writing for the .NET framework, writing .NET apps, are encouraged to make security part of everything they do with the application. They can set up um, partitions in Active Directory where they store different versions of application code. They can set up groups and authorization stores that allow a subset of users to do things with the application and to define exactly what they can and cannot do with the application. It's called role-based management. And if you don't have any developers developing for this, none of it does you any good. But once you get them to that point where you do start seeing these applications coming out, there's a tremendous growth area in what you're going to be able to do in terms of securing Windows, in terms of securing terminal services as well. So that's kind of a nod to authorization management and development practices. Also, the operating system has some new security defaults and new options. Active Directory, ha Directory has new security defaults and options. How many of you have implemented 2003 Active Directory? Okay, not very many. For those of you who did, did anything surprise you? Just to show of hands if you had any surprises. So you all did your homework before you rolled it out. Oh, who said they had a surprise? It's like an, it's an auction, I see movement, I figure it's a hand raise. What are some of the changes in terms of 2003? When you take a 2000 Active Directory environment and you bring it up to 2003, what happens right off the bat? Do you know? Just give me a couple. Nobody knows you just rolled it out and it went beautifully and you don't really care what happened? Yes? Yes, actually there are, I think it's 17, it's either 14 or 17 LDIF files that are applied. When you take your 2000 Active Directory, one of the things you have to do before you can even deploy your first 2003 domain controller is to upgrade your schema. And if you pick apart those LDIF files, which sadly I did, you'll find that there are some pretty significant changes being made to your schema. There are some group separations that are occurring. There are some certificate services objects that are being created. And that's another area where there's been tremendous growth in 2003 is certificate services. If you haven't looked into it, you really might want to take a look at PKI stuff, which we're not going to talk about here, unfortunately. But some very basic things that happen when you upgrade your schema. First and foremost, the anonymous logon account changes a little bit. Does anybody know what happens with the anonymous logon account? I'll take that as a no. Do you know what the anonymous logon account is? Just a show of hands. Okay. How many of you think it has something to do with IIS? And that must have been a leading question because no one's going to say yes because you figure I'm going to spank you for that. 
The anonymous logon account has nothing whatsoever to do with IIS. It does not relate to anonymous access to web pages. With Microsoft operating systems, with NT, with 2000, with 2003, every connection is identified as somebody. You may not realize that's what, hap what is happening, but that is what is happening. If you establish a connection to a server without identifying yourself, you are actually identified as the anonymous logon account. That is an account that you cannot populate. You can, however, grant permissions to that account. Well, that anonymous logon account historically has been part of the everyone group. And what that means is if I fire up a command prompt and do a net use whack whack server name, whack share name, or whack IPC dollar sign slash user colon null, I have just established a null connection to a server and potentially have now begun to be able to read Active Directory. In Windows 2000, when you built Active Directory, one of the things you do during the, the installation process is de decide if you're going to have permissions compatible with NT4 or just 2000. When you set permissions compatible with just 2000, this relates to the anonymous logon account, the everyone group, and some permissions in Active Directory. When you say, I want to set, loosen my permissions a little bit, you're actually allowing the everyone group to do a lot of reading of Active Directory, and that's for LDAP retrievals. With 2003, where this really changes is the, the anonymous logon account itself. In 2000, anonymous logon is a member of the everyone group. So I can do that net use whack whack server name IPC dollar sign connection, and I'm anonymous logon, and because I'm a member of the everyone group, and because everyone is a member of the pre-Windows 2000 compatible access group in Active Directory, which has read permissions all over the place in Active Directory, I can now retrieve information about your user accounts. And it's a sadly comprehensive amount of information. So one of the ways that this has been addressed historically is with the restrict anonymous settings. Are you familiar with these? If you aren't, you've been asleep for a while. Restrict Anonymous determines what you can do as far as establishing those null connections. And in 2000, they introduced the Restrict Anonymous 2 setting, which is no access without explicit anonymous permissions, I believe is how it's worded in group policy. Here's the problem with Restrict Anonymous being set to 2. It breaks more than it fixes. It breaks printing, it breaks SMS, it breaks a lot of Microsoft applications. Therefore, starting with XP, Restrict Anonymous set to 2 is no longer a supported option. As a result, in 2003's Active Directory configuration, you have the option to individually configure which shares are accessible anonymously and which are not. Additionally, because that schema upgrade takes the anonymous logon account and removes it from the everyone group, now anywhere that you have permissions where everyone can read or everyone can do whatever they can do, it doesn't matter because that anonymous logon account doesn't get it. If you try to connect using a null, or you try to establish a null connection to Active Directory in 2003, you'll find that things behave a little differently than they did in the past. And if you've used Tim Mullen's tools, he has several of them up on his site, user info, user dump, they don't behave quite the same way in a 2003 environment as they do in a 2000 environment. So that's something to be aware of, and there's a slide coming up on this. The only difference now between the everyone group and the authenticated users group is the built-in guest account. That's it. If you make a user manually, and you make that user a member of guests or domain guests, they're still an authenticated user. It is that one built-in guest account that is affected by this. And unfortunately, there's a lot of documentation out there that's a little off on this. How I determined all the things I just told you was by actually building all of this stuff, logging on, dumping my access tokens, and looking at what was in there. So a lot of cool stuff there. Now, what hasn't changed, not a whole lot. What hasn't changed is the things that you normally do to secure your environment before you ever touch that terminal server or before you ever touch the terminal services functionality. You will still implement patching mechanisms, hopefully. You will still implement firewalls, DMZs, IDS, excuse me, if you're using IDS. You still should be monitoring your network. You should still be auditing. You should still be logging. And I'll have some news for you about logging of terminal services a little later. I mentioned IPsec for limiting machines. Do you know why? What will this allow you to do, implementing IPsec, as far as terminal services is concerned? Nobody knows? OK. You can control which machines can actually connect to your terminal server. Because IPsec allows you to specify the ports, the protocols, the connection options, whether you require encryption or whether you just require authentication, and you can implement IPsec without encrypting. 
So if you like to see what's going by on the wire, it's still absolutely possible to do this. With IPsec, you can specify which machines even get to begin the connection process to your environment. And then there's the option to change your terminal services port, which has been around forever. And the reason I say why bother is you can find out what it is anyway. How can you find out where your terminal servers are? I've already given, yes. Yep. You are correct. You are correct. There is a utility out there. Anybody know whose utility? Tim Mullen has a utility. Yep. He's got a couple utilities. We're going to talk about that one, which is what, TS Info? will find your terminal servers regardless of whether you change the ports. And the disadvantage to changing the ports is you've got to configure all your clients to use a different port. So if I can find your terminal servers anyway, why bother going through the hassle of changing the port that it's listening on when there are far more effective things that you can do to secure these boxes? That's rant number one for the day. So that's what hasn't changed. As far as what has changed, just about everything else. Terminal services setup is a little different. How many of you said you were using 2003 terminal servers? Have you noticed that when you install terminal servers, it, it's quite a bit different than it was in 2000? Don't remember? Yes. <laughs> You're just going to say yes, so I go on to the next slide. One of the things you'll be offered during the terminal services setup process is what do you want to set your application compatibility permissions at? In Windows 2000, the users group and the power users group were actually different than they were in NT. The power users group in 2000 is roughly equivalent to the users group in NT, meaning they started to reduce the privileges associated with these built-in local groups. With 2003, they've actually extended this on to the terminal services setup where they say to you, all right, do you want to have full security on your terminal server or do you want to relax it? When you choose full security, you are restricting your user's functionality on that terminal server to user group functionality, which is that lowered capability. And what this means, of course, is they can't write to shared portions of the registry. They can't modify a lot of shared file system locations, registry locations, and so forth. However, this also means legacy applications may barf, and there are lots of them that will, barf being a highly technical term. So what can you do? You can get rid of your legacy apps, which is usually pretty unrealistic. You can relax the security, which is pretty unpalatable. Or you can take a look at something called the Application Compatibility Toolkit. How many of you have used this or heard of it? That's usually the case. The Application Compatibility Toolkit's pretty slick. It is a series of tools that will allow you, hopefully with your developers, to fire up an application. If you've used any of SysInternals tools, it's, they're a similar set of tools, but kind of packaged more in Microsoft did a little bit. With the Application Compatibility Toolkit, I can take an application that I know is a legacy application that can't run in the context of a user in 2003 that requires these power user privileges or even administrator privileges. I fire up the application and I watch what is it doing in the file system, what is it doing in the registry, what does it need to write to, where does it need to read from. You can actually then take those settings and save them as databases that you can centrally deploy to your clients. If you have not looked at the Application Compatibility Toolkit, search Microsoft site, it is a free download, and it is really quite impressive, and unfortunately, very low press about it for some reason. This has nothing to do with that application compatibility tab, which is rudimentary at best. Yes? Oh, fantastic. Excellent. Which booth? Microsoft. Oh, hi, Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft apparently has it available at their booth. And, and again, if you haven't looked at it, I, I really strongly recommend that you do. It's available for XP 2003, and I believe they just now released a version that works for 2000 as well. Is that true? Did you just read backport it to 2000, the compatibility toolkit? OK. I believe that the newest version has been, but I'm not sure. The unfortunate thing about a lot of the, the black eye that Microsoft has historically gotten in terms of security is the reason a lot of the problems exist in Microsoft operating systems is because of backward compatibility. Microsoft is kind of damned if they do, damned if they don't. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on tape, but I just did. If Microsoft makes the operating system as secure as it can be, as, as secure as they know how to make it, now your legacy applications and your legacy clients don't work. 
and everybody complains that Microsoft's trying to make a whole bunch more money. They just want you to buy new operating systems, buy new licenses. So if Microsoft says, okay, we're still going to support your 95, your 98, your NT clients, then you have all of these known security issues with the operating system. So that's my, my Microsoft plug for the day, but it, it really is true. And one of the things that happened with the development of 2003 is that Microsoft made a conscious decision to cripple some backward compatibility to, compatibility to say, we're not going to as easily support down-level clients and down-level applications. You're going to have to go and loosen things back up in order to support them. This is one of those circumstances where that occurs. Internet Explorer Enhanced Security, have you all seen this? You're just not going to nod anymore because you know I'll go on anyway. With a 2003 server, by default when you install it, Internet Explorer installs with enhanced security implemented. It's actually an option in Add Remove Programs in Control Panel. And what this essentially does is cripple IE in terms of functionality on the Internet at this point. However, this is a server operating system. You're not supposed to be surfing from your servers. The thought process then is if you're not supposed to be surfing from your servers, you don't need ActiveX controls, you don't need scripts, you don't need pop-ups, you don't need applets. All you need maybe is straight HTML. And when you go to a site where content has been blocked because of the enhanced configuration, it will, it will warn you, it will say, this has been disallowed. Do you want to trust this site, trust this content? And you get the option to do that. Unfortunately, on a terminal server, this can really minimize the amount of functionality your users have. So one of the things that will happen is when you're installing terminal services, it will say to you, you know, this is probably going to make your users a little angry because they're not going to be able to do a whole lot as far as IE is concerned unless you remove the enhanced security configuration. Terminal services connections. By default, when you install terminal services, only administrators can connect. In Windows 2000, you had a group policy option under computer settings, Windows settings, it's your uh, user rights. User rights on the system. And you could allow people to connect via terminal services. Have you all seen this? Well, if you have, great. If you haven't, don't worry about it because you don't need to use it. A far more effective method of allowing users to connect to your terminal servers is to populate the remote desktop users group on the terminal servers. And you can do this via group policy. The remote desktop users group allows people to connect with only the level of access that they should have, which by default is going to be user access. There is guest access as well. Also, remote administration and Terminal services are no longer a choice, a radio button, when you install terminal services. Remote administration is installed on a 2003 server automatically. It is not, however, enabled by default. You actually have to go to your system properties on the remote tab and select a little checkbox that says allow users to connect remotely to this computer. That enables remote admin. And it only allows administrators to connect unless you go and specify somebody else. When you install terminal services, you are installing terminal services in what used to be called application server mode. So there's no longer that, that GUI lumping together of those two functionalities. Terminal services licensing. I threw this in just because I've noticed it causes a lot of problems for people as they roll out terminal services. And I'm not going to address the whole, is Microsoft trying to gouge everybody for a whole bunch of money with licensing in 2003? If you've dealt with licensing in 2003, it has changed significantly. And one of the changes is you don't get those free built-in licenses anymore. However, if you purchased your XP licenses before some date, they'll give you a freebie. With all that said, and without getting too much into the economics of it, your licensing servers can now be installed on member servers. In 2000, you installed them on domain controllers. In 2003, you can install them on domain controllers or on member servers with one caution. If you install your licensing server on a member server, it will not be automatically discovered. With your licensing server installed on a domain controller, it is automatically discovered. And the reason for that is that a, a terminal server that's in a domain environment, the first thing it does when it comes up is checks a registry entry to see if it has a specified or preferred licensing server. If that ent entry is null or if it can't reach that machine, then it starts querying Active Directory. It looks for an, an actual object, and I have this in the notes for the slides. It looks for an object that specifies, here are the licensing servers for this environment. If that doesn't work, then it starts querying for enterprise and domain licensing servers. But because a member server isn't entering this stuff into DNS and into Active Directory because these are SRV style records, it's not going to be discovered. Therefore, if you do want to install terminal services licensing on a member server, you're going to want to look at deploying to all of your terminal servers 
whether it be a reg file or whether it be a script that you implement, manually make that registry entry. Otherwise, what's going to happen is in a couple of months, your users are all going to start getting errors about their uh, terminal services licensing expiring. Also, you have licensing per device or, or per user in terminal services in 2003. The per user licensing is kind of the honor system licensing. If you have 2,000 users who are going to be connecting to your terminal server and you license it per user, you will not see the licenses being sucked up. And that's because if you think about it, there's really no way to track. If I am Jane Doe and I connect from this machine to your terminal server and I suck up, suck up a user license, and then I go home and connect from a different machine, well, because I'm on a different machine, I would pull down another license and I'm using two licenses for one user. So there is currently no mechanism for tracking user licensing. Device licensing, absolutely. To pull down a license, you'll see it disappear, or you'll see it allocated in your licensing options, but not with user-based licensing. And it's my understanding that that will be changing somewhere down the line. The registry modification that you would need to make if you're going to install licensing on your member server or on a member server is this knowledge base article. Remote admin versus terminal services, we did talk about it, but there's one thing that changed. This dialogue that comes up when you set up terminal services, it says, you know, if you want to use remote administration, you get two free connections, administrators, blah, blah, blah. Well, really, you get three. Do you know why? You can now connect to the console to session zero in 2003. This is a beautiful thing. All of those poorly written applications that fire up their event messages to the console or that fire up their queries to the console instead of to the session, now you can see what's happening because you can connect to that machine. The farm that I mentioned that we have at my secret employer, we have in the neighborhood of 200 terminal servers currently for this implementation. And we do not, obviously, we do not sit at these machines to manage them directly. Everything we do in terms of administration is remote admin. And we even phased out another product because we've been very, very happy with the way that remote admin has worked for us. Additionally, when you have remote admin enabled, if you want to make sure that administrators aren't stepping on each other's toes, you can actually knock down the number of allowed connections. In 2000, it was two connections. That's all you got. With 2003, you can set it to one, you can set it to zero, but you've actually got that console session and two RDP sessions for a total of three. Do not make domain controllers terminal servers for numerous reasons. Obviously, domain controllers, you should never have users touching directly under any circumstances. Sending queries to a, a domain controller is one thing. Interacting with a domain controller is an entirely different thing. Additionally, when you take a DC and you try to install terminal services on it, it will let you, but it's going to say, hey, or if you install, I'm sorry, Active Directory on a terminal server, it'll warn you. It'll say, because this machine's about to become a domain controller, the only people we let connect our server operators and administrators and so forth, so now all of your users aren't going to be able to connect anymore unless you explicitly permission them. And rather than explicitly permissioning them, just don't put it on a terminal server or on a domain controller. The only exception to this would be if you have a lot of administrators, and those administrators do need to simultaneously connect to that domain controller, then you might actually look at installing terminal services on the domain controller so you can exceed that three connections, the console and the two but don't open it up to your users. Just don't use these as terminal server application servers. Anonymous connections, we did talk about. This is the brief documentation on this, that anonymous logon account, no longer being a member of the everyone group, you can put it back. There's a group policy setting that's allow everyone permissions to apply to anonymous logon, I think is how it's worded. And what that does is take the anonymous logon account and put it back into the everyone group. And of course, what that means is you've just relaxed significantly the amount of security in your environment. The advantage you get is the stuff you broke by disallowing these anonymous connections, anonymous reads, has now been fixed again. Configuring user data and profiles. When you have users accessing a terminal server, it's really a good idea to store their data elsewhere, not on the terminal server to which they're connecting, for rather obvious reasons. If you are storing users' data elsewhere, you do have the option to implement roaming profiles, which, as you know, have historically been problematic. They still are problematic depending on the size of your implementation. Again, I, I mentioned we've got a, a pretty large implementation where I work, and because of the way we implemented roaming profiles and the fact that we're using a lot of external storage functionality, we did run into some problems with it. And should you run into these problems, it becomes very obvious. You get the errors about your profiles not being able to be saved and so forth. There are a few utilities that you can get from PSS that do make it a little bit better. However, one of the things you might want to look at instead, or it's 
a supplement as much as possible is folder redirection. You may implement mandatory profiles where you log on and you cre create this very bare bones desktop that has just the things you want the users to access. You save that profile, you make it mandatory, it's just like you did in NT where you take NTUser.dat and make it NTUser.man. You store it in a central location, point all of your users to that as their profile. Great. They can log on if they make changes to their desktop, if they make changes to whatever they're working on, it's not saved anyway. However, with 2000, with the, the introduction of folder redirection, you have the ability to take a user's start menu, desktop, application data, and my documents, and redirect those to a server. And when you redirect those to the server, one of the chief advantages really is not just security, it's performance, because profiles are pulled over the network down to the machine at which the user is sitting every time the user logs on. Even though when that user logs off, you may not be saving any of that information, even though you may say don't cache roaming profiles, it still has to be copied down. With folder redirection, as a user uses objects, they're brought down, they're cached in memory. So when I open my start menu, that's when my start menu is retrieved from the server and it's fired up in memory, and I'm not pulling the whole thing down off the wire. When I save to my documents and it's redirected, I'm saving directly to that server to that share on the server instead of saving to the hard drive here and then synchronizing it up with the server. So it saves you difficulty in terms of dealing with what's left behind on the machine as well as where are you going to store the user data. Be very, very conscious of where you allow users to write and where you allow users to execute. And just so you know, it is not possible to do one or the other. You can't say, in this set of directories, users will have only write permission, and in this other set of directories, they'll have only execute permission because somebody with about this much coding capability, which means like me, can actually execute from a writable directory and vice versa. It's not hard. So you're never gonna get rid of that, that ability to write and execute from one place. Therefore, separate everything out as much as possible, separate partitions, separate machines, whatever you have to do. What else? Default operating system permissions. NTFS permissions have changed in 2003, and there are some very good changes. Do you all know in Windows 2000 what the issue was with being able to write to your C drive and write to System 32? This has been kind of bandied about for a few years. Suppose I drop my batch file that I call cmd.exe into something that's in my path statement or in the system path statement and my little batch file fires up a command prompt, but it also fires up whatever nifty utility I've dropped on my machine today. And maybe we're just talking about my workstation here. Then I call help desk and I say, help desk, I'm having massive problems with my machine. I can't figure out what's wrong with it. What's the first thing a help desk person or an admin does when they go to a user's machine to troubleshoot? Log in, <laughs> even if they do, or even if they don't, after they log in. Say they, they logged me off, they're not doing run as, What's one of the primary troubleshooting tools for most admins? Is it just me? Do you not use command prompts? You don't use command prompts? I do. Command prompts are, are one of the first things that I and most of the people I know fire up because that's where you run ping, that's where you run trace route, it's where you do your IP config, it's where you do all of your standard troubleshooting. Well, if I've dropped something into, the, into my system's path called cmd.exe or cmd.bat, and it's a recognized extension, recognized in my path. You type CMD, start run CMD. My batch file fires up, opens a command prompt for you, does whatever I wanted to do in the background in your context. Now this is kind of a, a far-fetched thing, and this has been discussed on Security Focus many times. It's kind of far-fetched, but it's not that far off. So in 2003, users cannot write to their C drive. They can't write to the system directory. They can't write to system 32 or the winder. They can't write to those areas that are straight path statements. They can write to their documents, to their specific pieces of the machine. This is a good thing. Also, administratively owned objects now show, and this is, it seems like a small thing, but it's kind of important from auditing. The owner of an object in 2000, in prior versions of the operating system, if an admin takes ownership of an object, it shows the administrator's group as the owner. Well, now you have the ability to show the individual admin who did it. And you could actually, I think, do that in 2000, but now in 2003 in group policy, you can say, whenever an administrator takes ownership of an object, I want it to be owned by that specific user, not by the administrator's group. In Active Directory, and this is something that I'm not necessarily 
thrilled about, and even in the file system, did you know that you could give away ownership of objects before? You didn't have to give someone take ownership permission and let them take it. You could actually, under the covers, give somebody ownership of an object with Subanacle. Well, because Microsoft kind of figured out everybody knew this, now it's in the GUI. You can actually grant ownership to somebody else. If you like it, great. If you don't, you're with me. Separate user data from the terminal server, which I talked about. Inherent risks in write and execute permissions for obvious reasons. As far as group policy goes, your existing 2000 policy settings related to hardening machines, relating to terminal services, those are still there. But there are over 200 new settings in group policy in 2003. A lot of them relate to terminal services. Also, software restriction policies. Have you talked about software restriction policies at all this week? Do you know what they are? Okay, only a couple people are nodding, which is good, because we're going to be talking about them. In fact, I think we'll do it right now. Well, not just yet. Yeah, we will. All right, my environment, which I probably lost connectivity to, I am running two VMs on my laptop, which means my laptop doesn't like me very much. Okay. And I periodically lose connectivity to my VMs. But not this time. Okay, this is a snap-in I created, obviously, for Black Hat. And in it, I've got my Active Directory management tools. I have the Group Policy Management Console, which does now have a service pack. If you haven't gotten the service pack one version of it, take a look at it. How many of you have used GPMC? Wow, not very many. If you haven't used GPMC, go download it. It's free. It's very cool. It does a lot of what Fazam did in 2000. But it gives you the ability to, to get much more comprehensive reporting and management capabilities as far as your group policies go. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how I structured this Active Directory implementation that I built. Right now, I am connected as an administrative account to my terminal server, but I'm connected from that to my domain controller, which is this machine right here. That's my DC, that's my terminal server, and then I've got all these user connections that we'll be looking at. In AD, when I built AD users and computers, I have this Corp OU. And the Corp OU, for any of you who have seen talks I've done before or read anything I've written, I have a, a great affection for a Corp OU. Because quite often, I would, when I was still consulting, I would go into a company and they would say, we want to implement a policy that applies to everybody in the company except our administrators and our servers. So we're going to set this domain level policy and then filter it. Well, you don't need to do that. Create a high-level OU. Inside that OU, put all of your regular user accounts, your workstation accounts, keep your servers separate, keep your administrative staff separate, and now you have effectively domain-level policies where you don't have to filter out your admins and your servers. Of course, inside here, I did what I never do and put my servers right inside Corp. So in my servers, I've got a terminal services OU. I've got file servers IIS. If you've read the 2000 or 2003 security guides, you know that Microsoft has given you lots of pre-built templates that you can apply for baselining your servers. By creating OUs for those different types of servers, it makes it very easy to implement these baselines. Now, within my users container, I've separated out administrative staff and terminal server users. And one of the, the biggest problems you'll run into with terminal services in 2003 is a lot of these settings apply no matter who's connecting. They're terminal server wide. There are a few settings that exist in group policy both in user configuration and in machine configuration. But that brings into question how do you implement loopback? How many of you really understand what loopback is about? That's pretty common too. Okay, the world's fastest loopback explanation. When a, a computer starts up, it goes and queries Active Directory and pulls down group policy, specifically pulling down the sections of group policy under machine configuration. It could care less about what's under user configuration because that's HP current user stuff in the registry and it doesn't have a user yet. So the machine starts up, goes to Active Directory, pulls down its site domain OU policies, implements those, modifying HP local machine. A user logs on to the machine. That user's object is located in the Active Directory, site, domain, and OU level policies, user configuration settings according to where the user object is located in Active Directory are then applied to HP current user. Well, unfortunately, sometimes you want your servers to have some settings that apply regardless of who the user is, where you're looking in the user configuration section of group policy and you think, well, I would like that to apply to everybody. And it then means, well, you've got to go find every user who's ever going to log on to this particular machine and put it in their settings. Obviously, that's not realistic. It's impossible. 
So that's where loopback processing comes into play. Loopback processing lets you set one of two modes, merge or replace mode. If you take a machine and you implement loopback loop back processing in merge mode, the machine comes up, gets its HQ local machine settings by going site domain OUOU reading, HQ, or reading machine configuration. User logs on, user object is located in Active Directory, HQ current user settings are implemented, site domain OUOU, but then the machine turns right back around, locates its own object again in Active Directory, and processes the policies that lead up to its object, this time reading the user configuration settings instead of reading the computer configuration settings. And because they are applied later than the user object's user configuration settings, they win. So they'll override user settings in the case of a conflict. What merge mode is good for is when you have users who do need some settings to be different, but there are certain things you want to be consistent regardless. With replace mode for loopback, the user object is ignored in group policy processing. It doesn't matter where the user lives in Active Directory. All of the user configuration settings come from where the computer object is located in AD. Now this brings in the problem of, well, I've got users who I want to have their settings regardless, and when they connect to the terminal server because I'm implementing XYZ, they're going to have lockdowns because of the fact that this is a terminal services implementation, and it's going to limit the amount of work they can achieve. So what you may want to consider is implementing a separate directory for terminal services. And what this means, of course, is that you've got to come up with a way to synchronize information. We have a lot of developers where I work, and we actually had a developer just use the native Windows APIs to take credentials that we pass from one of our directories to the active directory where we implemented terminal services. Those credentials get passed any way we want them to be passed, and one of the things that we do when we pass them is build some very, very long, complex passwords. And this helps you deal with that inherent huge problem in any network, which is users who reuse the same password over and over again, who minimum password lengths because your vice president of marketing says, I can't remember more than five characters. You end up with these five character passwords and so on. If you are taking a user's information and programmatically popping it into this active directory, you can require as long and complex passwords as you want. This is a pretty cool thing. And as you know, Microsoft does have some tools to allow you to synchronize some of this information, but if you've got developers in your environment, have them take a look at the native API. It's not that difficult. Why are 15-character passwords important? You should all know this. 15-character or better passwords. Mm -hmm. The way that passwords are stored is in two seven-character blocks for NTLM, or LM and NTLM hashes that are built for Active Directory. You're never going to get rid of NTLM hashes, but they're fairly well crippled if you go with 15 or more characters because of the fact that you're losing some of this information. The easiest way to disable the generation of down-level hashes of passwords, which as you know, the certain people will probably in this room can very easily crack for you with their utilities. Uh, the easiest way to disable the generation of those hashes is to require your users to use more than 15 character passwords, which of course most users are pretty resistant to, even people in security. This is an argument I've had with a lot of security people. But yes, that's where I'm going next. There, which, thanks, you know, now that you mention it, there is in 2003 a new group policy setting that actually allows you to disable those down-level hashes, those LM hashes, so that they are not created. One caution, it doesn't take effect until the passwords have been changed. So if you have an existing implementation and you decide you do not want land mangler hashes being generated for your passwords, you go implement that setting until every one of your users has changed their passwords, you've got a whole lot of hashes out there. This will also include, of course, service accounts and your administrative account where you don't have to change your password ever. So those are, th are things to be conscious of. As a, a piece of trivia, how many of you know how to require more than 14 character passwords in Windows 2000? How do you do it? Pardon me? Yeah, if you, wanted to, if you want to, in 2000, require, say, 20 character passwords for every user in your domain, the ADM templates that ship 
with Active Directory or with Windows 2000, you can actually go in and edit those, which in turn modifies the registry, and you can change the minimum password length there. So you could say, okay, I'm going to change this to 20, because as you know, the UI only lets you go up to 14 characters when you're setting password length. In 2003, I have yet to see this documented, and I have yet to find anybody who has been able to tell me, do you know how to do it in 2003? Is there anybody here who does? Nope. Okay. This is your secret information that isn't documented anywhere that I know of. So write it down. It's not my slides either. In 2003, if you directly edit that ADM template the way you could in 2000 and you say, I want to require 20 character passwords, here's what's going to happen. Your domain controllers are all going to start throwing up errors about how they can't replicate group policies. And it's going to go to seven character requirements for passwords. So your users can now implement seven character passwords and you think you've got 20 character passwords and it's not happening. In Windows Server 2003, if you want to require more than 14 character passwords, fire up ADSI edit, go to the domain object, and there's a minimum password length attribute. Set it there. That one does work. So that's your freebie trivia for the day. So all that said, here in my OU structure, I've got my user objects and I have them separated out by different levels of functionality. Who can do what? This is one of the things that I would not be able to control if I did not implement loopback processing on my terminal server. If I say terminal server, here's all the settings, they're the same for everybody. Now I don't have the ability to say these users get this application, these users get this other application, which brings me to the terminal services settings that I want to show you. Okay, here's my terminal services policy. And you wouldn't necessarily implement all the settings in one policy, but in this case I did. And I didn't implement everything because of the fact that these VMs take so long to boot up or to start up as it is that it would just be painful. If I show all the settings that I have in this particular setting, this is one that I really like. This is new to 2003. In your Windows Setting Security Settings, Local Policy Security Options, you can now disable the built-in administrator account on every machine affected by this policy. So all of those exploits and tricks and doodads that you are aware of that target administrator account are fairly well pointless at this point because the account's useless. This is aside from the fact that you could give it a 127 character password and make it effectively inoperable anyway. This disables the account altogether. I strongly recommend that before you do this, you make a copy of the account, make sure you've got an administrative account, and that you look at restricted groups in group policy and make sure that you put your domain admins group into the administrators group on all of your machines. Otherwise, you're not going to have an administrative account. But this does work. It's pretty slick. Also, setting the guest account, you can disable the guest account, which you could do before. Accounts limit local account use of blank passwords. This will, in 2003, if you did not know this, if you have user accounts where the user has a blank password, they're no good over the network. You must have a password in order to establish a connection to a 2003 box, even an XP box, over the network. But local logons still allow blank password usage. With group policy, you can disable that as well. Rename the administrator account. The reason I have irrelevance, why did I call my administrator account irrelevant? Because renaming the administrator account is not something I would actually consider a security measure. It's ridiculously easy to determine what is the administrator account on a machine just by retrieving its known SID. Also, when you rename the administrator account, nobody ever changes the description on it, which says built an account for administering the computer or domain. So even if I called it my super top secret non-admin account, it's pretty obvious which account it is even without retrieving the SID. Rename the guest account. I like to rename the guest account administrator just because it's fun. Other options you have, you can restrict CD-ROM and floppy access to locally logged on users only with a terminal server. These are some pretty vital settings because you really don't want users accessing what they may, what you may have left in the CD drive or in the floppy drive on that machine. Domain member, digitally encrypt secure channel data when possible, require strong Windows 2000 or later session keys. Are you aware of SMB signing requirements in 2003? When you run DC Promo to build a 2003 domain controller, one of, in fact, the very first screen that comes up says, NT and Windows 95 machines are not going to like what you're about to do. There are some additional considerations, and they give you a handy-dandy help link that nobody ever clicks and nobody ever reads because it's just the first screen that comes up and nobody reads those. 
Well, what that stuff actually says is that in a 2003 domain, by default, all domain members are required to implement SMB signing for all communication with your domain controllers. And what that then means is your NT boxes, if they are prior to service pack four or six, and your Windows 95 boxes, if you don't have the directory services client installed on them, can't talk to your domain controllers anymore. If you hit Microsoft's news groups, you'll see person after person posting, hey, I implemented 2003 and now none of my 95 clients work and I don't know why. I can ping, but I can't establish a session. Well, you can't establish a session because you're not signing your packets. And of course, you could go in and disable this setting, but why would you want to do that when you can actually make your NT boxes, your 95 boxes, and your 98 boxes use SMB signing? So in this particular policy, I said do it. Participate in it, which a 2000 or later box will do when prompted, but you can tell your terminal service, do it regardless. Also, some pretty basic stuff that you've seen in the past. Do not display last logged on username. Do not require control alt delete. I disabled this to say no matter what, we will require control alt delete logons. My logon text, we'll just go right past that. Number of previous logons to cache, none. I don't want any cache credentials on these machines. Interactive logon, log when to prompt the user to change their password. These are things you've seen in the past. Default owners for objects. This is what I was referring to earlier, where I said you can say in-group policy. When an administrator takes ownership of an object, it shows the actual administrator who did it. And then we get into this setting that's going to become much more important, which is use certificate rules on Windows executables for software restriction policies. Software restriction policies are pretty cool, though there are a couple of things to be aware of. And they're coming up, so more on that later. I've populated my built-in administrators group on the machine and the remote desktop users group on the machine. So any machines in the OUs where I've linked this policy, this is what these group memberships will look like. Set a couple of, let's see, this one, secondary logon. This is currently set to automatic for demo purposes, but you may want to disable this. Do you know what secondary logon is? Run as? Okay. Run as is where I say I, you're logged on to your machine as you. I need to do something in my context, or I'm logged on with a regular user account, and I need to perform an administrative action. It's a very cool thing, but with software restriction policies, when you run as, you bypass software restriction policies. So if you're going to use software restriction policies, disable the secondary logon service, and unfortunately, you're going to have to give your administrators terminal services connectivity in order to do administrative work and, and lose the run as capability. That's the trade-off for it. File system permissions, you can, of course, configure. Be cautious when configuring file system permissions via group policy. The more of them you configure, the, configure, the longer it takes your machine to boot up. Other things, offline files, disable those. Be aware that anything that you are using for profiles, for terminal services profiles, for home directories, you should disallow caching on those folders. Otherwise, your event log is going to fill with errors, and you don't want users caching that anyway. Then we get into the terminal services stuff, and I'm going to edit this policy so I can show you all of the settings. Whoops, wrong one. Under administrative tool or administrative templates, Windows components, terminal services. This is obviously much larger than it was in 2000. In 2000, it was pretty rudimentary in terms of what you can set. So things that you can set, let me go to standard view so it's a little easier to see. You can set keep alives for connections. And what a keep alive is, is in the past, if I lost my connection to a terminal server, I didn't go and, and cleanly disconnect it so the server knew I was gone. Well, there was no mechanism for the server to know I was no longer there. You can implement keep alives so that when I lose my connection because I drove under a bridge and lost whatever connectivity I had, or walked under a bridge, rather, my keep alive not hitting the server lets the server disconnect me even though I have an active but or an inactive but connected session. It's different than disconnecting. Disconnecting is I click that darned X that ships with the terminal services client or I right click remote desktops and I choose disconnect or I'm leaving my session running but I'm letting the server know that I'm disconnecting from it. This controls accidental disconnects, network blips. Automatic reconnection. Will you allow automatic reconnection with RDP 5.2 with the newer version of the protocol? That's built in by default to automatically attempt to reconnect when there are network blips. So on the client side, it will try to reconnect when it loses its connection. And you can say, yes, I want to allow that or I don't want to allow it. Restrict terminal services users to a single logon session, single remote session. If you enable that, it means that Jim Bob Billy Joe can't connect five times to your server by walking to a bunch of different machines and establishing that those separate connections utilize resources on your servers. 
Enforce removal of desktop wallpaper, primarily for performance purposes. Deny log off of an administrator logged into the console. This is because of the ability to connect to the console in 2003. If I am sitting in the server room with a mouse and keyboard and monitor hooked up to the server, and you remote in, and you have the option selected in your remote desktops like I do here to connect to the console, what would happen is suddenly my machine locks because you can't actually have two people, at least not this way, looking at the console at the same time. So I just got locked out while I'm in the server room madly trying to get something done because you got curious and connected in. So you could set a group policy and say don't allow that. Don't allow them to be locked out. Limit the number of connections. Limit maximum color depth. Allow users to connect remotely, if at all. Notice I do not have this configured because of the fact that I populated the remote desktop users group on the machine. Do not allow local administrators to customize permissions. One of my personal favorite things to do when somebody locks down their terminal servers in 2000 is to go and modify the permissions directly at the terminal server. When you implement this setting, even though I have local administrator rights on that terminal server, I can't change those permissions for the RDP protocol, for client connection settings, all the stuff that's in the RDP protocol. Remove, rem remove Windows security item from start menu so that they don't get the Windows security dialog box. The remove disconnect option is pretty rudimentary. It just disallows the user from choosing disconnect in the drop down list when they try to leave the terminal server. It doesn't stop them from clicking the X and closing the, the connection that way. There are registry hacks that will allow you to make that X button actually do a log off. And the reason you want to get rid of disconnected sessions or you don't want disconnecting of sessions is because they use resources on the machine. As I mentioned the size of the farm that we have, I was running through our terminal services at one point and I found administrators who had been logged on for uh, 25 and 30 days with inactive connections. Now you can go through individual accounts and limit their connections or you can use group policy to do this. Path for roaming profiles for terminal services users, home directory path, remote control rules, you require the user's permission to interact with their session and so forth, and then this one, start a program on connection. Now this is pretty cool. This is something that historically has been only the domain of Citrix, and I'm not saying that Citrix is going anywhere, we're using them. When you start a program on connection to a terminal server in 2003, this is the user's shell. So if I give Jane Doe notepad, Jane Doe's shell is notepad. When Jane Doe closes notepad, she is logged off from her terminal services session. The problem here is this is a machine setting. So if I set it here, everybody who connects to this terminal server, that's their application and that's where loopback comes in. Rather than setting this here, this setting also exists in the user configuration and this will allow you to do what I've got up here, way up here, which is to have different levels of terminal server users and to these different levels on each of these OUs I have policies publishing different applications to the different users. On this terminal server I've set merge mode for loopback processing. These users get their startup application based on the OU they're in. Now the applications that I've given to these users are not recommended applications as you'll soon see but this is a level one terminal services user and this person gets notepad eventually. And I might as well connect all of them because it's going to take a minute. Okay, here's Notepad. User 1, if user 1 closes Notepad, instant log off of the session. Great, we love that. Except for the fact that I gave user 1 Notepad. Do you know why Notepad's dangerous? You'll find out in a minute. Going to connect user 1 back up. While user 1 is connecting, user 2 gets IE. IE is a disaster in terms of what it allows a user to do, which is why software restriction policies are going to become really important shortly. Here's user 1 logging on again, getting notepad. And I think, well, user 1's got this one application. Obviously, when user 1 closed it, it shut down the entire shell, logged him off. There's nothing he can do. It's really very simple for him to, in notepad right here, type start iExplore.exe and save it. Then he can do a file open, and it opened it here because I had that in my last one. Normally it'll open to his documents. He says, I don't want to see just text documents, I want to see all files. Here's his ie.bat file. He right clicks it, he chooses open. Now he has Internet Explorer. So much for that one program shell. And now, of course, he can do this.
System 32, command.exe, this user has a command prompt. And because this user has a command prompt, those settings like a list of allowed applications that you had in 2000 terminal services, they're unaffected when they're run from a command prompt. So now the user can start regedit edit if the user can type. We have a happy user who has instantly escalated his or her permissions. This is pretty, pretty rudimentary stuff. TS user 2, we made it all the easier because we gave this user IE right off the bat and said, here you go. Go get a command prompt. User 3, we just gave him the command prompt. Started right off good. And user 4, we've given nothing. But we've given user 4 a basic desktop that I have not locked down. The only reason I haven't locked it down in terms of what you're seeing is because of the amount of time it takes and I had to rebuild my VMs yesterday. Otherwise, I would have given you very stripped down desktops. And if you haven't seen the, the settings in group policy for this, they existed in 2000. They're relatively unchanged in 2003. So now that you know where the, where the issues come in with users doing things they shouldn't be able to do with their terminal services connections, how do you deal with them? There are options in group policy to control whether or not a user is allowed to use a command prompt. I think I've got it in this one. Mm, those are logs off. Well, here's one of the ones I want to talk about. You can disallow, ooh, and that's going to bark an error. You can disallow the command prompt. You can say, don't allow a user to have a command prompt, and there's actually, in 2000, an actual setting for this. That does not stop a user from running command.com, which is not a 32-bit application. And because it's not a 32-bit application, and it's not cmd.exe, which is what the command prompt is, they're good to go again. However, there's a setting to prevent access to 16-bit applications. In that scenario, if a user comes in here and says, I want to run command.com, hopefully I have this implemented. Yep. It says, sorry, can't do it. This disallows NTVDMs, which is what all 16-bit applications run in those virtual machines. One thing to be aware of, if you have unpatched XP machines, this doesn't work. They need to be service packed. There was a little glitch in 16-bit functionality. It works now, though. So that's one way. You have the option to get rid of the command prompt via the terminal services setting. You have the option to disable 16-bit application access, which, of course, breaks all your 16-bit applications that you shouldn't be running in terminal services sessions anyway. And then you have software restriction policies that go far beyond this. Software restriction policies, I have a couple of them here. Software restriction policy one is my software restriction policy that's going to break a whole bunch of stuff. Under Windows settings, security settings, software restriction policies. If you haven't looked at this, you really want to look at this, but you also want to do a lot of planning with it. The first thing you have to do with software restriction policies is right click and create a software restriction policy. There won't be anything here by default. Obviously, I've already done it. And when you set software restriction policies, you get these two security levels. The default is unrestricted. Here's what this means. If you say I'm implementing software restriction policies and you go with the default, based on the user's regular old permissions, any application can run, which means Joe Blow can fire up a command prompt because he's allowed to run a command prompt. You can then go in and specify which applications you do not want him to run. Now, this is useful if you have functional desktops where you just want to lock down a few things, but if you have a terminal server where you want to be very specific about what exactly can run, you may want to consider setting a default level of disallowed. And what disallowed does is it doesn't matter if as a user I would normally be able to run a command prompt, I'm not going to be able to run it unless an exception is made. That's where the additional rules come in. There are four types of rules that you can set. There are certificate rules, hash rules, internet zone rules, and path rules. Path rules are better for opening up functionality rather than locking down functionality. Because let's say, for example, you set a, you set a default policy of unrestricted. So by default, everything can run. And then you say, OK, we're going to lock down everything in System 32 and say it can't run. When you say lock down everything in System 32, all I have to do is find a directory where I have write capability and upload a command prompt to it, command.exe. It's not in the path that you specified. It runs fine. What path rules are for is if you have a policy where you've disallowed a whole bunch of stuff, even maybe a default disallow policy, and you want to allow the contents of a specific directory or specific registry path. So it's for exceptions to lockdowns as opposed to lockdown exceptions. 
or exceptional lockdowns, whatever it may be. You have internet zone rules, which are based on the internet zone, which you can configure via group policy. And I think the competing talk is actually discussing Service Pack 2 for XP. This is something, I know there's some new functionality in Service Pack 2 as far as configuring internet zones. That would allow execution of software based on whether this is a trusted zone, whether it's the local computer, intranet, intranet, so forth. Hash rules actually allow you to browse to a file and create a hash of the file header. The advantage to this is say I want to run a command prompt and I decide I'm going to be sneaky and I'm going to upload it to my documents where I have write and execute permissions. So I grab a command prompt off my local drive, drop it into my documents in my terminal services session, and I fire it up. Well, if it's the same version of the command prompt that's on the server, it's not going to run. That's the key, though. If they're different versions, what you need to do is get the different versions of the command prompt or notepad.exe or whatever this may be and hash each one of them. So that's kind of the weakness with hash rules is, is I'll just get my command.com or I'll get a different version of cmd.exe or whatever, and I'll run it that way because it doesn't match the hash. Which brings us to certificate rules. With certificate rules, if you're not familiar with code signing, Microsoft has been working on this for a while. They've been encouraging developers to do this for a while. You've worked with authentic code, I'm sure. With code signing, with PKI in 2003, you can actually generate a code signing certificate. You generate a code signing certificate with your own internal CA. And what you can then do, and this is why I enabled certificates, uh, software restriction policies in my terminal services group policy, is you specify that you will only allow software to run if it has been signed with this certificate or this certificate or this certificate or this certificate. And you use authentic code technology, you use any of your Visual Studio.net, any of your developers can sign software for you. Now, the software that has been signed by the certificates that you specify in this case would be the only software that is allowed to run. Of course, the difficulty with this, you have to figure out every single thing that needs to be signed in order to run. You've got to be very, very comprehensive in terms of characterizing what an application does on the system especially because of this. We've got this enforcement designated file types trusted publishers. Enforcement. This is not the default option, by the way. By default, enforcement of software restriction policies is for all software files except your libraries, DLLs, which of course brings in, into play the possibility of exploits via DLLs. So you could say, OK, we're going to require software restriction to be processed on all software files, regardless of whether it's a DLL or an executable, the trade-off for this is performance. You better have some beefy terminal servers and don't be overloading the number of users on these machines because it does greatly increase the, the processing time to go through and evaluate all the components of an application. It also means that you, if you implement DLL checking, you have to find every single DLL that is used by every single application that you're allowing your users to run. It's a lot of work, I say this from painful experience, but if you actually take the time and you go through this process and you, you implement all of these settings, it's a pretty tough terminal server to crack. Also, you get to specify whether these restrictions apply to all users or all users except local administrators. While it's, there's an inherent distaste for exempting administrators from this stuff because now as you know, administrative accounts are the key to the kingdom, and this doesn't change that. This is also about the only way that you're going to have functionality for administering this server after you lock it down. So I would, in most cases, recommend that you do exempt your local admins and use the restricted group settings in group policy to control the membership of the local administrator's group. Designated file types, these are the, the default settings for the file types that are affected by software restriction policies. So anytime I try to fire up some events in .bat, .chm, help files or a bonus for exploits, command, com, whatever it may be, all of these by default are affected by software restriction policies. If I want to extend that list, I can. If I wanted to throw .doc files in there, I could. If I wanted to put spreadsheets in there, I could. And as you may or may not know, Office is one of the, the easiest ways to dig into a machine when you shouldn't be. We ended up replacing Office with our own versions of a spreadsheet viewer and a document viewer and so forth because of the fact that it was so difficult to lock down everything that they do. But that is a temporary measure. You also specify who gets to select trusted publishers. Do users get to select trusted publishers? Is it only local admins or is it enterprise admins? So now Jim Bob Billy Joe can't say, well, I'm going to trust 
VeriSign to give me signed applications and that way, because they're a trusted publisher, they can run. No. You also specify what are you going to check as far as the certificate to determine if it's revoked, the publisher, timestamp, or both. So this lets you do a lot of controlling and checking of which software has been signed by whom and whether or not it's allowed to run. Now as far as what I have in terms of the additional rules, these four right here are default settings. These default settings, when you implement, there goes my mouse. The mouse disappearing is a bug in this MMC. I would also recommend with terminal servers that you turn off your screen savers because the reason the mouse, if you notice this with remote desktops, your mouse will disappear. The reason it disappears is because one of the machines to which you've connected its screen saver is kicked on. So if you want to get rid of that problem, just don't implement screen savers, and then you won't lose your mouse. So now that I have my mouse back, by default, when you implement software restriction policies, HQ Local Machine Software, Microsoft Windows NT Current Version, System Root, System Root.exe, System 32.exe, and your program files directory are unrestricted, which obviously means even though you may have locked down stuff that people upload into their own directories, you haven't really restricted stuff that they're going to use to get at the operating system anyway, like a command prompt. This policy, which I left at the default, I'm going to implement, and I lost my mouse again. The other option is you close and reopen the MMC. Okay, so my terminal server, which is right here, Software restriction policy one is the one where I have not locked down beyond, or I've not disabled those default unrestricted options, even though my policy says everything else is disallowed. I will actually enable that link, run GP update. Do you all know SecEdit doesn't do group policy updates anymore? In 2003, SecEdit is only security configuration and analysis. If you want to refresh group policy, you use GP update. Connect to the existing session kind of defeats the purpose of that. And while this is going, I think I'm probably way over my time. What time am I supposed to be done? Three? What time is it now? Three. Don't worry, I'm almost done. All right, with the software restriction policy that I set up, not here. I think I allowed notepad, command prompt, maybe not even notepad. And I've got to look at it to let you know because now I've lost it. Okay, I have said that anything signed with the certificate that I gave to myself will be allowed to run. I left those default system root settings allowed to run. I believe I allowed Internet Explorer. I did a hash rule for that. And I don't think I addressed the command prompt. So now, Jim Bob Billy Joe, TS user 1. fires up his little IE file, supposing he hadn't gone to system 32 when he opened this up, which is the result of my own goofing around with it. He uses his batch file to fire up Internet Explorer, which he uses to browse to system 32. And even though he, in theory, isn't going to be able to run anything that I've not allowed for him because we've made the exception for system 32, for the Windows directory, everything in here he can now execute. Command prompt, regedit, whatever it may be. 
ditto for TS user 2, TS user 3, TS user 4. So obviously this policy we decide is not quite restrictive enough and I'm going to implement the second software restriction policy. I'm almost done. The second software restriction policy actually goes through in all of those path statements that by default are unrestricted. I set them to disallowed. Now what this does mean is you have to explicitly allow some other items. You must allow Explorer. If you don't allow Explorer, the user can't get the shell to get the log on to log on to the terminal server. So unfortunately, that's still kind of a weakness. And because of the size of the demos, I allowed Notepad, IE, and the command prompt. But that's it. That's all I've allowed in this particular policy, which I will link and update. So Jim Bob Billy Joe, the dude who wrote his launch IE batch file. When he tries to launch that file because it is not covered by the exemptions, he can't run it. He can't run batch files, can't run command files, can't run executables. All he can run is, if he were to get to these, notepad, internet exploder, and, and command prompt cmd.exe, which of course I would have normally locked down. If you've not looked at software restriction policies, it really is time to do so. Okay, do not use variables in the start path when you, when you are assigning an application to a user with the whole use structuring that I told you about. If you use, say, percent winder percent, like for the notepad user or the, the command prompt user, when you implement software restriction policies, it can't figure out those variable paths, and what you've actually told the operating system to run for the user won't run. So you've got to do an explicit path to the application that you want to run when the user logs onto the terminal server, and then accommodate it in your software restriction policies. Security settings we talked about. Talked about. Authorization Manager, this is what I was referring to with development for the .NET Framework. It's fantastic, but there are some pretty heavy limitations. First, your applications have to be written to utilize it, where developers have said only people who have been granted this role or membership in that group can read this application's data or can modify this application's data on this machine under these circumstances. So if the applications aren't written for it, it's pretty useless. Additionally, Authorization Manager requires your domain's functional level to be at Windows Server 2003 functional level, which means you have no down-level domain controllers and you've manually gone, th manually gone through and raised up that functional level. Get your developers trained. So logging and auditing. How many of you have tried to log Terminal services in 2000. How many of you have looked at the logs for terminal services connections in 2000? Is terminal services logging good? You can probably tell what I'm looking for as an answer here because it's still kind of sad. Logging of terminal services connections pretty much consists of this user logged on and you can sort of get the IP address, and Mark actually is the person who deserves credit for this one. The IP address that is reported for the terminal services logon doesn't come from the IP stack. It comes from the RDP protocol. So even that is, is a caution. The logging has not significantly improved in 2003 when it relates to terminal services. You still audit and you can still see users log on to your terminal servers. And if you're doing standard object access auditing and so forth, you can backtrack and you can figure out what the users have been do doing. And you can do all the other things you learned about earlier. But if you're looking for nice, clean terminal services logs where it says, Jane Doe logged on from this IP address at this time, launched this application and did XYZ, it's still not there. Hopefully somebody will come up with a fantastic logging tool so that I can start promoing it. Hardening applications, not part of this session because that's what you were doing the rest of the couple of days. Okay, it's kind of compressed. There's a lot of stuff in there because this could easily be a, a full day 
worth of information, but these are the areas that I think people should take a look at with hardening terminal services in 2003 outside of all the stuff that you've already talked about. Are there questions? Dead silence. Rock. <laughs> okay, that's it.